92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program features a performance by poet Anne Carson and was recorded March 26, 2008, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bernard Schwartz, the acting director of the Unterberg Poetry Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's performance by Anne Carson. The show, which will last about 50 minutes, is a performance of two separate pieces, and there'll be a brief pause in the middle while the stage is reset. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Anne Carson. Hello, good evening. Thank you for coming. Just by being here tonight, you have all become honorary members of the neo-post-fluxus movement, (laughs) of which you will see assembled on stage the vanguard members. (laughs) Indeed. I like that phrase, vanguard members, but I can't remember if it means the back or the front of the army. But I guess since we are the whole army, it doesn't matter. We're going to present two different pieces. They're unrelated to each other, except that they both began in my workbook as essays, which then became lectures and then sort of exfoliated into other forms and various media and collaborators. I couldn't have done any of it without my main collaborator, Curry, who is the person I think with. And tonight I'm being assisted by a lot of other people as well, and their names are in the program. I won't name them all now. So the first piece is an essay on translation, more or less. It's called Cassandra Float Can. It's a piece that arose out of what seems my lifelong efforts to translate Aeschylus's Agamemnon, especially the parts about Cassandra. Um, So it concerns Cassandra and translation and some related topics. Um, It's organized in three cuts. There will be the original cut, the birthday cut, and the final cut. So... Here goes. Cassandra Float Can, original cut. Everywhere Cassandra ran, Cassandra found she could float. How did she float? With her float can. Does that sound like a tautology? But the arts of prophecy are often tautological, they reason in a circle. The prophet must prove to you that she is a prophet by telling you unbelievable news, which you will only believe if you already regard her as a prophet. If the news is not unbelievable, then she is just a news source. If the news subsequently comes true, then she was a prophet, but it doesn't matter now that the news is widely available. Cassandra's is a conundrum of the veil, Where is the edge of the new? Where is the edge of belief? Is it possible to believe something truly unbelievable? How does that begin? Is there a crack of light under the door? How do you know to see it as light? Is there an edge of light all around the dark mass of your life up to this moment? Can you see the dark mass as a veil? Can you want it gone? Can you say, flick flack, it's gone? Cassandra can. Who is Cassandra? For a dime, she will tell you that the swimming pool is full of blood. Like space time, she is non linear, non narrative, and the most beautiful of Priam's daughters, according to Homer who says that when she stood up to prophesy, she shone like a lamp in a bomb shelter. Your eye is inclined to bounce off, then glue itself onto Cassandra's surface. 
The longer you look at her, the more fiercely you have to struggle to see her light, which seems to sink its beam into you at a hotter and hotter frequency. Eventually you notice that something stinks. It is the gelatin of your own eyeball. A smell at once small and gigantic. Some people find it sexual. I do not. To me, it is the smell of matter experiencing its own future. Scientifically, the smell of a rip in space-time. Sometimes I feel I spend my whole life rewriting the same page. It is a page with essay on translation at the top, and then quite a few paragraphs of good, strong prose. These begin to break down towards the middle of the page. Syntax decays. Perforations appear. By the end, there is not much left but a few flakes of language roaming near the margins, looking as if they want to become an art of pure shape. Here is another fact about me. Whenever I am engaged on a translation project, I experience continually offside my vision, a sensation of veils flying up. As brightness blows the rising wide, cold rush the skull. I've come to call the sensation Cassandra because I first noticed it one day in school when I was translating a passage of Aeschylus Agamemnon, the passage where Cassandra cries out in Greek, Atatatoi papoi da. This cry is famous. It leads into 300 lines of vision and prophecy in which Cassandra tells the past and future of the house of Atreus, including the fact of her own death. At the midpoint of this telling, she utters these lines in English, Behold, no longer my oracle out from veils shall be glancing like a newly married bride, but as brightness blows the rising sun open, it will rush my oceans forward onto light, a grief more deep than me. What is it like to be a prophet? Everywhere Cassandra ran, she found she was already there. Everywhere Cassandra ran, the glue was coming up off the edge of the page, and when she pulled at it, this page was underneath this page on which I am telling you that everywhere Cassandra ran, she found she could float. You may think I am making the matter unnecessarily complicated, the matter of Cassandra everywhere she ran, But let's return to her opening line, Atatatoi papoi da. This utterance is a scream. It is untranslatable, yet not meaningless. A scream conveys specific emotion and can make things happen. In this case, the scream is also metrically exact, fitted into the scansion of the verses around it, Often in English translation, such utterances are rendered by the word alas. Should alas seem inadequate, the translator may choose to transliterate the Greek letters of the scream into English sounds, as I did when I said atatatoi papoi da, on the grounds that this is more pure and true. Is it more pure and true? Perhaps a prior question is in order. What is Cassandra doing speaking Greek? She is, after all, a Trojan princess who has never been away from home before. Now, generally, we refrain from asking this kind of question about the logic of a play. We don't really want to listen to Cassandra speaking ancient Trojan for the next half hour. And there is a dramaturgic convention called the willed suspension of disbelief that makes it okay. But in this play, Aeschylus has already punctured the convention, for he begins the Cassandra scene with Cassandra standing silent on stage for 270 lines. Then Clytemnestra shouts at her, "'What's the matter? Don't you speak Greek?' 
Aeschylus would like us to see the veils flying up in Cassandra's mind, would like us to be wondering at what level of herself she is translating some pure gash of Trojan emotion into a metrically perfect line of Greek tragic verse and what that translation has to do with the arts of prophecy because in both cases there is some action of cutting through surfaces to a site that has no business being underneath. What is the future doing underneath the past? Or Greek metrics inside a Trojan silence? And how does it alter you to see it there floating, and how can it float? I am interested in people who cut through things, When Aeschylus's Agamemnon was performed at Cambridge University, England, as the Cambridge Greek play for 1900, the role of Cassandra was taken by a young man named J.F. Crace. Mr. Crace wore veils and made a wonderful impression. He was probably encouraged, as were other young actors who played Cassandra in those days, to let his voice crack on stage during Cassandra's long speech. This was thought to add poignancy to the delivery and show the prophet stimulated to a breaking point. Cracks, cuts, breaks, gashes, splittings, slicings, rips, tears, conical intersects, disruptions, etymologies. Here is another one I like. It has nothing to do with Cassandra. We need a rest from Cassandra. (laughs) I have a friend who is a philosopher. He told me that the phenomenologist Edmund Husserl, who lived 1859 to 1958 and wrote a dozen or so books in his lifetime, left behind at his death some 30,000 pages of unpublished manuscript. Moreover, these pages are written in shorthand. The notion of 30,000 pages of Bavarian shorthand fills me with wonder. Why did Husserl want to write so fast? What thought was so urgent that he had to scrape it straight off the surface of his synapses rather than letting it move through the usual sequence of conceptual and syntactic formation? What exactly is the usual sequence that Husserl was trying to disrupt or cut through? It may be relevant that Husserl was a mathematician before he was a phenomenologist. Mathematics has in common with shorthand an intention to reduce or abstract a relatively larger piece of meaning to a relatively smaller set of marks. But mathematics is not done in haste. We think of a mathematical equation as something that happens at the end of a long process of question and pondering, not first and fast. Shorthand, on the other hand, is a tachygraphic system enabling a person to write legibly at the rate of speech. What is the rate of speech? It is tied to the rate at which thought moves in the mind. But we all know from the sensation of it that thought moves more quickly and in a different way than speech. Speech is already a kind of shorthand. Yet speech again is quicker and different than sentences written down. There seem to be veils upon veils upon veils here. Where is the original surface? If we were romantics, and possibly some of us are romantics, we might imagine that there is in our minds, one or two beats before a thought forms itself into anything like mental speech, into phrase or sentence, into an order of communication, something earlier, rougher, more gripped, more frail, more saturated, something that will dry away like the dew or crumble like prehistoric paint as soon as it's exposed to air something that, compared to a sentence, is still wild. Husserl wanted to press the lips of this thing onto paper and make a mark. 
What did he plan to do with the marks afterwards? Whatever his plan was, 30,000 pages of manuscript attest he couldn't carry it out. Or maybe he had no plan. Maybe he just wanted to cut the thing free from use and let it disappear into its own presence. There was an artist named Gordon Matta Clark, born in New York City, 1943, who completed more than 50 artworks before he died untimely, age 35, in 1978. Not one of Gordon Matta Clark's artworks is extant. To know what they were like, you have to consult archival photographs or ask people who saw them. What Gordon Matta Clark liked to do was cut things, usually big things. He split a house in half in New Jersey in 1974. He cut huge circular and boat-shaped holes in the walls, floors, and ceilings of a Paris office block in 1977. He made a diagonal pattern of spherical cuts up through the floors, ceilings, and roof of a Chicago apartment complex in 1978. These structures were all slated for demolition before he found them, and he got permission to intervene in and alter the process of ruin, which ran its course after he had finished. His best-known work is one for which he did not get permission— In 1975, prowling around the New York City waterfront, he found an abandoned pier that appealed to him. He broke into Pier 52 and spent two months making cuts 20 to 30 feet long and 10 to 18 inches thick in the corrugated steel of the wharf building. Pie-shaped, sickle-shaped, and elliptical cuts. He also cut through the floor to expose the water below. He said various things about these cuts. He liked the way light passed alive across the floor. He wondered how it would be to sit and watch this passage of light over the span of, say, a year. He wanted to make volume visible. He wanted to see the Hudson River sparkle inside. He spoke of liberating the compressed force of a building simply by making a hole. He hoped to retranslate the space into something he could taste. Soon enough, the police found out about the retranslation going on at Pier 52. The site was confiscated, the building padlocked shut, charges brought against Gordon Matta Clark, who left the country for a time. The work which Gordon Matta Clark had titled Day's End continued to be visited by people who broke in. It was soon demolished by the New York City Economic Development Agency. By the time of Gordon Matta Clark's death three years later, critics were calling Pier 52 a radiant, perilous cathedral and an example of a revolutionary new genre of behavioral architecture. So it goes with the prophets. You see them float, and how they float, and how can they. Gordon Matta Clark did not call his projects architecture. He invented a word, an architecture. This word has a nice etymology. If you take the prefix an as an indefinite article, it implies his work is one of many possible architectures. If you take the an as a negative, his work is an antithesis or antidote to whatever architecture claims to be. I just like to get in there and alter it, he said. Each alteration was analytical. He did months of research before starting to cut a building. The cuts were based on exact knowledge of what he called the semiotic system of the building's construction. His method was to cut away surface until he could see what was really inside. He made a building into an abstract of itself. Not so much to create beauty as to get information. He said his cuts were probes. He was probing for something he called the thin edge. 
This is from an interview he did in 1974. It was kind of the thin edge of what was being seen that interested me as much as the views that were created. Let's pause to consider the etymology of the word etymology. It comes from Greek etumos, an adjective meaning real, true, actual, and logos, the basic noun for word, story, account, analysis. But the adjective etumos in turn has an etymology, probably derived from enai, the verb to be, to exist. So an etymology can be thought to give the true meaning of a word because it has isness in it. The etymologist makes cuts that show being as it floats inside things and how it floats and how can it. To return to Cassandra. Her big prophetic scene in Aeschylus' Agamemnon begins with her screaming, atatatoi, etc., as I've already mentioned. After screaming, she calls out the name of Apollo six times, then again a seventh time, but the seventh time, by shifting the inflection of the name slightly, she shows its etymology. For Apollo's name is cognate with the Greek verb apolesthai, to destroy utterly, to kill, to slay, to demolish, to lay waste. By crying out, Apollon Emos, Cassandra can designate the god as my Apollo and my destroyer at the same time in the same words. If words are veils, what do they hide? What difference does it make to see a wharf building as a cathedral for 10 seconds or two months or a year? to see Apollo, the god of healing and truth, as a murderous pun. I only accidentally learned Greek from a bored high school Latin teacher who decided to teach me to read Sappho on my lunch hour. My entire career as a classicist is a sort of preposterous etymology of the word lunch. (laughs) When Clytemnestra shouts at Cassandra, What's wrong? Don't you know Greek? Cassandra responds with a scream and an etymology and a prophetic vision. She splits open our idea of what it is to know Greek. She removes the walls and floorboards, and suddenly we are in a site slated for demolition, this site which is not just her body, not just the city of Troy, not just the house of Atreus, but our whole way of knowing the truth about such things, our longhand approach to every question and answer, our entire careers as classicists or architects or prophets or whatever we are, the way we float and how we float and can we float. Cassandra can. Gordon Matta Clark had a twin brother who was mentally unstable all his life and who died by jumping out the window of Gordon's studio in 1976. I also had a brother and am perhaps over-inclined to view brothers as causal. So leaving causality aside, I wonder if having a brother who comes and goes from his mind all the time might make a person especially aware of holes and splits and disruptions. There is a thin edge that appears where no edge is scheduled. What a sudden amount of information is released there. What a startling amount of fear and pity. After his brother died, Gordon Matta Clark made a work in his memory at a gallery in Paris. He dug a large hole in the floor of the basement of the gallery and sculpted a staircase of shallow descending steps on one side of the hole. Working by the light of a bulb suspended from the gallery above, he was visible to passers-by at street level through a vent in the gallery floor. When the staircase was complete, the hole was filled in again. No trace now remains except a few Polaroids of Gordon Matta Clark digging.
Cassandra's last words in Aeschylus's Agamemnon are concerned with pity. Here are three translations of lines 1327 to 1330 of the play, just before she goes off stage into the house to her death. Translation 1. Alas for human fortunes! If a man has good luck, some shadow could overturn it. When his luck goes bad, a wet sponge erases the whole picture. For this I feel the greatest pity. Translation 2. But you, O human things, a shadow is enough to, a sponge could wipe you off, you who barely float, and how you float, and can you, you I pity. Exit, Cassandra. Translation 3. Sight demolished and removed. Cassandra Float Can Birthday Cut. Float arts prove which if, if doesn't. Swimming the she-shelter surface struggle at is gigantic the rip. Greek veils crack another. Dime quicker anything away exposed bounce beats. Is she the beam eyeball of rewriting? Is the rendered English home to disbelief like she has sight silence? Good is art offside, call the prophecy a deep glue. House until screaming, etymology removes longhand. And these husserl his husserl quickly to paper. Romantics thought more. Was country to the later art revolutionary so float? Prefix until beauty is much etymology. For I lunch wrong what this whole kill can. In he broke. Alas, really. Just overturn you can. Pity the exit. Cassandra Float Can Final Cut. If gigantic veils bounce silence offside screaming, these romantics float until lunch broke. Alas, just exit. Aeschylus Agamemnon 1180-283 As brightness blows the rising and hang in it, their glory stare out. The end. Well, now that we've dismantled the House of Language, we're going to build it up again in poetic form. Um, The second piece is a sonnet sequence, uh, which means 14 sonnets and then a 15th one made out of the previous sonnets somehow. And, um, yeah, and then there's a lot of other stuff that will happen. Hope you like it. Possessive used as drink me. A lecture on pronouns in the form of 15 sonnets. Triple Sonnet of the Plush Pony, Part 1. Do you think of your saliva as a personal possession or as something you can sell? What about tears? What about semen? Linguists tell us to use the terms alienable and inalienable to make this distinction intelligible. For example, English speakers call both blood and feces alienable on a normal day, but saliva, sweat, tears, and bowels they do not give away. Bananas and buttocks in Papua New Guinea belong to the inalienable class, while genitalia and skin of banana 
are not held on to nearly so fast. Such thinking will affect how a word like rape is defined, or how sorcerers aim their spells, or how you feel in your mind when you address animals. Of course, cows and cats, sheep, pigs, donkeys, dogs, and rats depend on their owner to keep or dispose, but your pony you cannot sensibly classify with those. Triple Sonnet of the Plush Pony, Part 2 Another thee, another thee, another thee, another thee, another thee, another thee, a summer's day. Double vantage me, never to repay, and will in overplus, making addition thus. Your pony is all these to you and more. He can detect the smell of danger and will not take you through a door if there is doom or pain there. So at the end of his life, if you want to sell him for me, you will have to change the pronoun with which you greet. You have, have to change the pronoun with which you greet. At dawn, shaggy head. At dawn, shaggy head. At dawn, shaggy head. Triple Sonnet of the Plush Pony, Part 3. A body in the dawn, a body in the cold, a body its breath. Its breath a plume, a dance a plume, a dance not thou, a thou a thee, thou breath, there stands breath plume, how cold is, a dawn is, how still stands thy breath. There stands, there stands, there stands, there stands, there stands, how cold is, 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 how cold I force myself to contradict myself in order to avoid conforming to my own taste. Marcel Duchamp. A sonnet is a rectangle upon the page. Your eye enjoys it in a ratio of eight to five. Let's say you are an urgent man in an urgent language, construing the millions of shadows that keep you alive. If only, if only it were, were water, or, or innocent, or, or a hawk from, from a handsaw. If only you were Adonis, or Marcel Duchamp. If, if only, only you were you Adonis, Adonis, or Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp. Settling into your half hour of sex or chess, not this raw block cut out of the fog of meaning, still damp. But no, you are alone. Whatever idea here rises from its knees, to turn and face you quicker than a kiss or a hyphen or the, or the very, very first, first moment, moment you felt, felt the breeze of being a creature who will die one day, not this, will ask of you most of your cunning and a deep blue release like a sigh while using only two pronouns, I, I and not, not I. I. Recipe he, hers, himself, she. His, herself, me, mine. Myself here, we all are in the, in kitchen. the kitchen. Now, now first, first, get the stove very, very hot. hot. Use all three, three elements. elements. That is, use one, one element to heat the soup. soup. Use, use one, one element to toast the nuts. He likes soup, she likes nuts. They'll, They'll have, have soup, soup with, with nuts. nuts. But look... 
one, one element, element is left, left over. over. While, While they, they sup, one might use it to burn the pronoun off one's lips. Sonnet of Addressing Gertrude Stein. Here is a Here pronoun, is a pronoun to, address to address Gertrude, Gertrude Stein, Stein with, with colon, a dog you've never had before has died. Sonnet of Addressing God. Some people continue to hear a voice calling out but to address God is a violent act. Use slashes. Use them without restraint, but neatly. Neatly, God swung her slash, slash, his slash, slash, their slash slash God's legs over over the the side side of the girder, girder. holding herself, himself, themselves, God's self by the fingertips. He slash, she slash, slash, they slash, slash, God slash, Lord both, both legs, legs, till her slash his slash, slash their slash, slash God's body hung free. We slash, slash you slash, slash they slash, 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 slash one screamed from below. God let go God and dropped. dropped. Merce sonnet. Narrative some dance is, other not. Two opposite places to start. Telling stories. Graham, Martha, take a name, play a part. Fame, on the other hand, Cunningham, Merce, got a lot by making the place of the proper noun empty but hot. Improper, you could say, Merce dancers are nouns, or rather, pronouns. To uproot themselves is how they move from each location. Which of Antonin Artaud calls to mind a quotation? To dance wrong side out, again the dancer teach. Wrong side out, I see, your body cannot a story reach. But why again? Again means when? In whose prehistory? Let us inquire of pronoun, the etymology. That the pro means instead of, no doubt you have heard. But for saying earlier, prior, before, pro is also the word. Perhaps in this way came to us dancing, very early, starry, stumbling, chancing, that first into hour of air, blue, black, and bold, before of our names, the terrible gusto took hold. An example, late afternoon, 1941. Of Graham, Martha, the technique class is almost done. Outside are growing New York streets dark. From Keller, Helen, today's visitor, comes a legendary remark. So light like the mind, she says, with her hand on the waist, of a student, it is Merce, who does a few skips in place. Kiss the pronouns. Early they are so, so are they frail. Look sharp, you can through the room see how they sail. Why, a pronoun that dances is tangible for miles. Even a deaf, blind person will be wreathed in smiles. Sonnet of addressing Oscar Wilde. Hesitate, hesitate, hesitate. hesitate, hesitate. Who's that man next to George? Hesitate. I don't know, but she's kind of cute. Hesitate. You don't have, have to, to be, be Venus, Venus extravaganza, extravaganza nowadays, nowadays to want to call, call your boyfriend, boyfriend she. she. 
It is mostly men who do this. Women wonder where it leaves them. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. Oscar Wilde To Lord Alfred Douglas Letter of July, 1894 I have no words for how I love you. This, this question, question of no, of no words, words, no words that, that are legal, legal no, no words, words that, that do the trick, trick no, no words, words with, with a shock all along the edge. edge. How, how to, to get, get a shock? shock. Apply, Apply something, something cold to something, something hot. hot. Where to go, Where to go for, for something, something cold. cold. If, if it, it is winter, winter go, outdoors. go outdoors. If, if it, it is gender, gender hesitate. Hesitate, hesitate, hesitate. All hesitate. genders are hot. Although the one you the want one you in will generally be seem less hot than, than the one, one you are out. 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 Deictic quiz sonnet. One. There was some delay was with some some delay, delay, some delay the body with of the chocolate, the the fire, the fire, 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 to light. light. Homer, Iliad, Iliad 23. 23. Answer. It, it declined, declined that. that. Two. There are the days that bring dear love. Emily, Emily Dickinson, Dickinson, poem 1696. 1696. Answer. There, there are, are those that, that love these. these. Three, kill, kill me with spice, me with spice. we must so not be foes. foes. William Shakespeare, Sonnet 40. Answer, do, do thus to, to avoid, avoid such. Four, in ballet classes, in ballet classes, I want to see how it feels, feels, how it 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 feels to you. Merce Cunningham, interview. Answer, there, there I, did I did this to that, to that not, banana, not banana, banana, to, to break, break caliper. caliper. Five. Anyone knows anyone knows anyone loves. Gertrude Stein on poetry and grammar. Answer. Hey, puto, turn that shit off. Six. They seem to be full of fun and unintentionally. unintentionally. John Keats, speaking of Shakespeare's sonnets, letter of 1817. Answer. Your face bewilders me. You are such a breather. <laughs> Dropped sonnet. When a language drops a distinction, as for example English has modified the second person singular so that I can no longer express the wish, tell me, spirit, whither wanderest thou? Or split a king in two, saying, if thou beest not immortal, look about you. There is a lowering of arms, a thinning of air inside the whole system, a sadness in the sparrows, a slipping, a slipping away, away of prefixes, prefixes and, and wisdom. Last for alas, less for unless, pale for impale, unsist for unresisting, and weather is one syllable, and needle rhymes with kneel. Yet I confess not until I met you did I begin to feel this change as a loss. There was, there was something, something about, about the laundry chute down which we tumbled. tumbled. This, this mine shaft, shaft, mine shaft, to bottom, 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 Sonnet of the Pronoun Event 
One, a man and a woman looking for pronouns. Two, all the people going down to look for pronouns. A man and a woman looking for pronouns. Mud taken up looking for pronouns. All the people Two, going three. down to look Four. for pronouns. Three. Washing the pronouns in the water, water to remove, remove the mud. Five. 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 Washing them washing them the mud has gone on the the mud. Mud. Washing the pronouns in the water to remove the pronouns in a basket. in a basket. Washing them in the water to remove the pronouns. Washing themselves off after the mud has gone Are walking from the pronouns. Are pronouns pronouns dry to sit down? Are pronouns not Walking from the pronouns to the pronouns not very dry to sit down. Are pronouns not very much? Our pronouns, our pronouns, pronouns not very much are like our pronouns, 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 pronouns not very much. Our pronouns not very much like our pronouns not very much. Our pronouns not very much. Our pronouns not very much like Yes, they are very much like lilies. Otherwise, how could they constitute an event? Sonnet of Exemplary Sentences from the Chapter Pertaining to the Nature of Pronouns in Emile Benveniste's Problems in General Linguistics, Paris, 1966. This time I forgive you, but I shall not forgive you again. I observe that he forgives you, but he will not forgive you again. Although I eat this fish, I don't know its name. Spirits watch over the soul, of course. I suppose and I presume. I pose and I resume. I suppose I have a horse. How in the world can you afford this house, I said, and she said I had a good divorce. (laughs) Strangers are warned that here there is a fierce, fast dog. Whores have no business getting lost in the fog. Is it to your ears or your soul that my voice is intolerable? Whether Florinda lays a hand on his knee or his voluble, he pleads a headache, and the narrator concludes, the problem is insoluble. Beware the fog and 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 the fog as I or we or one, part of a system that argues with shadow like Venetian blinds, speaking of Venice, called the Shakespeare of cities by a friend of mine, reminds me how often the sonnets misprint there for thine. Beware the fog in Venice. Beware those footsteps that stop in a hush. I used to think I would grow up to be a person whose reasoning was deep. Instead, I became a kind of brush. I brush words against words. So do we follow ourselves out of youth? Brushing, brushing, brushing. Brushing, 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 brushing. Wild grapes onto truth. Sonnet of We Tried Doing It Without the Cue Sheet But Couldn't Remember What Color Referred to What Movement and What Had Been Done and What Was Left to Do. At least they are light animals, gently back and forth while upside down. Boy enters Boy the world and he falls under girls. girls because it needed a pipe to hang on allowing the passion, and it is passion, to appear for each person. Today, Today, pillows 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 landed. landed. I was just getting interested. Walk to places for arms in air. Break. Break. 
How do you How turn? Do you turn? I, can't I can't turn. turn. I can't turn. And then begins step, step, leap. She continues these leaps. Scramble the scramble, clothes, scramble, 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 clothes, scramble, 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 eggs. scramble eggs, and without premeditation, but in full arc, if possible, have, have a good, good time. time. Sonnet of the English Maid Cabinet with Drawers in Prose. Let's think about varieties of enclosure, places to lock things away. Shakespeare's sonnets have an inside-the-brain hush, as of a man reasoning with or confessing to himself. Some sonnets address a master, some a mistress, one a master mistress. These seem conjured presences, not a real person who stands there listening. Let's think about varieties of listening. For perhaps the first 15 years of their existence, Shakespeare's sonnets were private poems. Before the London bookseller Thomas Thorpe printed them in 1609, they circulated as manuscript copied by hand, given from friend to friend. You might have kept yours in an English-made cabinet with drawers. Let's think about varieties of you. If you are Helen Vendler, You will be watching out for puns all the while you read all that Shakespeare wrote. Indeed, the word all in Shakespeare's usage, according to Helen Vendler, can be a synonym for everything, or it can denote the masculine sexual apparatus. You may think this kind of surveillance has nothing to do with enjoying Shakespeare, but then for him the word nothing could be the opposite of something, or denote the feminine sexual apparatus. Of course, most English-made cabinets had a secret drawer. My question about that would be, where did they keep the key to the secret drawer? In another drawer? Even more secret? Is there such a thing as a pun of a pun? Have I told you that your face bewilders me? and that one day rummaging in your cabinet I opened your secret drawer by accident. Whether or not I found a secret there, of course, I can't say. But it was shortly after that I patented my amazing invention, the pronoun stack train. The pronoun stack train can be assembled at home and comes with directions. The directions are in code. Here is a pun for the code. Spruced in her succinct parts, these wholesome else came dim outdoors to lunch the sublime. Crowning Sonnet Fashioned from the foregoing 14 sonnets by by chance chance operations. operations. Declined reindeer avoid ballet classes unintentionally. You are alone. You are alone. Both legs. Both legs. To Lord Alfred Douglas, letter of July 1894. Soup and wine. Sadness and mystery. you are This time I forgive you. I will not forgive you again. What about today? Pillows landed. What about tears? What about breath? Walking from the pronoun place to find some. I opened your secret door. What about beware the fog? Today pillows landed. Beware the fog in Venice. Beware. I opened your secret door. Its breath. A plume, its breath, a plume, a plume, its breath, a plume, its breath, a plume. The end.
Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. For more audio and video programs and information about our upcoming events, please visit 92y.org. This program is copyright 2008 by the 92nd Street Y.